AMD's back again to fill out the uh, 6000 series family tree. I mean, in the beginning, there was the 6900 XT, MSRP 999, tariffs and some other things have some, some things to say there. That one came from AMD.com, I bought that one. And uh, AMD is the only place I think that is still selling it at the pre-tariff price, definitely taking a loss. It's nice. Let's refer to that card as utterly redonkulous. Then there's the only slightly more modest 6800 XT. Almost as fast as the 6900 XT, a little bit cheaper. Again, exciting cards, Our, you know, big Navi, finally launched, a lot of anticipation, a lot of stuff that came with that when we saw it last year. Enter the 6700 XT, launching today. But does it have the goods? Oh, I think it does. But let's talk about why, because mostly it does. Oh, it's just so cute. If the 6900 is utterly redonkulous and the 6800 XT is maximum overkill and the 6800 is pretty overkill, is this one just right? I think this is the much more reasonable card. This is a reasonable level of overkill. If you're a 1080p gamer, this is still more than you really need unless you're gaming at like 200 FPS. In the box, to be honest, it's pretty minimalistic. Get this cool little cover and a little bit of paperwork. That's really it. That's all you get other than the card. You don't need any special adapters. You don't need any special anything. It's just the card in some packing foam. And look, it's not, you know, it's, it's not super heavy. You know, they've got a copper heat pipe design. I can see by looking through the heat sink on the side here, but this card is not, is not weighty. It's not, uh, it's not substantial in the mass department. It's not got, let's say junk in the trunk. It, uh, it feels much more like a mass produced product. And I think this is probably what is meant for, not the super volume card, but the definitely more volume than the 6900 XT card. In terms of power requirements and physical form factor, I love that this is only two slots and it's a breathable two slots. You've got a little bit of room here for it to suck air in. I really dislike the trend of giant enormous heat sinks on graphics cards because with my Threadripper workstations and when I'm running VFIO, I like to have multiple graphics cards or multiple, you know, beefy uh, PCI Express peripherals in my system. And um, the bigger the graphics cards get, the less room I have for other peripherals. So I really like that this GPU is uh, as compact as it is. A lot of the OEMs that we're gonna see build this card, board partners, AMD board partners to build this card. They're gonna go for more than two slots of heat sink, but the relatively modest power requirements of this, a, a, a single eight pin and a single six pin, um, this thing really didn't generate all that much heat. The two fans were more than sufficient to keep it cool. It was a little overclockable, the memory wasn't, but the core was. You can get a little bit more performance out of it, but uh, overall I didn't find that, that it was, you know, heating up the room with 500 watts. There's also not really any danger of this thing tripping your overcurrent protection on your 750 watt power supply, as we saw with uh, some other SKUs up the stack. In terms of outputs, it's pretty bog standard. You've got three DisplayPort 1.4 outputs and an HDMI 2.1. HDMI 2.1 works great with that LG OLED display on Mega Desk. I really, really like that. There's also the possibility of running up to six displays off of this card. Six displays out of four connectors, how are you gonna do that? Club 3D makes a DisplayPort 1.4 to 3X DisplayPort 1.2. MST hub. It's not just an MST hub, it also has display stream compression. This hub is one of the best pieces of MST hardware that I've ever used. MST, when I've, when I've ever used it, has historically been buggy, frustrating, and awful. This MST hub happens to work with the Level 1 Tax KVM. It works well, and it'll take your single DisplayPort 1.4 and give you three DisplayPort 1.2. That's up to 4K 60 hertz and three different outputs. So with that, you can run up to six connections off of this card. That's what the AMD driver stack supports. And that seemed to work pretty well for me, running a mix of 4K and 1080p displays because, you know, mega desk. But uh, yeah, nice job. Good, well done, AMD. Start with the older AAA titles, things like Shadow of the Tomb Raider. That is a very, very respectable score. 73 to 76 FPS at 4K with a 6700 XT. 
yeah, that's not entirely unreasonable to expect out of this card. I mean, it does have 12 gigs of VRAM after all, and that's one of the differentiating factors that AMD mentioned in their press release, 12 gigs of VRAM, because they don't think eight or even 10 is really enough for AAA titles with all of the graphics options turned on. Now the whole story there is that, you know, with games like, well, pretty much most modern engines, there is a certain amount of texture compression happening under the hood. Yeah, it does technically take a little bit of load off the games, but it's gonna vary from game to game as to whether or not you run up against this. Also fiddling with the texture sizes in the first place really goes a long way toward mitigating that. So depending on what game you run, you may not even run up against an eight or a 10 gig limit, depending on what you're doing. Still, it is nice to have 12 gigs of VRAM. I'm not gonna argue against that, and especially not at this price point, because it seems pretty clear that AMD has teed this thing up to compete with the 3070, and versus the 3070, I'd certainly rather have 12 gigs of VRAM over less, as long as the performance is there. And that was the other upset, that's the other surprise. As we get into our other games, like Far Cry 5, patterns are starting to emerge. It seems like this GPU, the 6700 XT, can outperform the 3070, especially at 1440p, especially at 1080p. If I stop again for a second, kind of look at this, I mean, if you had a GPU that can do 100 frames per second at 4K, all things being equal, just in terms of pushing pixels, you would think that at 1080p, you might expect 400 frames per second, because there's four times as many pixels of 4K as there is at 1080p. If the performance were strictly a function of the number of pixels on screen, that might be true. But there's a lot of other bottlenecks in the rendering engine, the pipeline engine, and everything that goes into dealing with that. DLSS from AMD's main competitor here, NVIDIA, really goes a long way to reducing the actual number of pixels that have to be computed and then using fancy AI magic in order to scale up the performance or scale up the graphical fidelity and, uh, you know, effectively run the game at a higher frame rate. AMD has similar tricks up their sleeve. They have Fidelity FX. AMD was first to the party too with Fidelity FX, I might add. And these tricks or shortcuts are uh, strategies for actually lowering the number of pixels that have to be rendered, but ultimately offering uh, an experience that has similar, if not identical, visual fidelity to what you would experience running at the native resolution. So like, if we wanna run at 4K, I could actually, you know, in terms of the number of pixels rendered, only render 2560 by 1440, and then through fancy AI or Fidelity FX, content adaptive sharpening, different strategies can scale that up to 4K. And that actually sort of makes the difference here. If you wanna turn everything on with DLSS, you can end up with a really high fidelity image. The video card is doing less work, like that 3070 is doing less work than the 6700 XT from AMD. So how do you do the comparison? How do you do an apples to apples comparison? And the reality is that you basically can't. It's not really exactly the same in terms of the rendered frame. It's not really exactly the same in terms of the features. This is already being a little bit of a problem with DLSS, but now variable rate shading is entering the picture. And if you look at the VRS benchmarks in 3D Mark, AMD GPUs are pulling way ahead. Hardware Unboxed recently did their uh, video where they sort of discovered that, hey, the NVIDIA driver has a little bit of overhead, especially on older or slower CPUs. They showed that, that AMD had a little bit of an advantage uh, over NVIDIA in terms of their driver architecture, especially with slower CPUs because the AMD GPUs could pull farther ahead. Really what those observations come down to is the difference between DirectX 11 and DirectX 12. Now, AMD GPUs have hardware to assist with DirectX 12-like functionality. It's actually technically found in Vulkan. So DirectX 12, can do Vulkan stuff, but Vulkan needs a little bit more work to be DirectX 12. It's not, you know, it's not commutative, I guess. Um, I don't wanna get super down in the weeds on that, but on the NVIDIA side and their driver stack, they've gotta handle that a little bit more in software rather than hardware. And that's what some of the driver overhead comes from. If you've got a fast CPU, it really doesn't matter too much. There's a, there's a kind of misleading story you can tell here at the 1080p, and that's the reason why I mentioned graphics scaling in the beginning. Because there is non-linear scaling with the different resolutions, there's an upper limit on the performance at 1080p that you can expect from any given game based on any given uh, you know game engine. Like with GTA 5, when we were looking at it at the dawn of time, 
the engine breaks when you go much past 140 FPS, give or take. And if you can keep it under 140 FPS, you have a really amazing gaming experience. If you got one of these really high-end machines and you still play GTA V, install a frame limiter, limit it to 140 FPS. You'll be surprised how smooth that gameplay really is on GTA V when you've limited it to 140 FPS because basically the system keeps it at that frame rate all the time and nothing weird happens and there's no glitches or stutters or anything. So as we look at the other games, that we benchmark as we go through the list here, we can see that the 6700 XT is pretty consistently pulling ahead of the 3070. Pretty much the only scenario where the 3070 is going to pull ahead of the 6700 XT is when DLSS is a factor or you've got more optimizations on the NVIDIA side. Now, all things being equal, uh, it does seem like NVIDIA has more features on the software side, but AMD is really not far behind with the improvements and uh, other quality of life changes, let's say. Dirt 5 was another game that had really amazing performance on the 6700 XT. The, these GPUs do support hardware ray tracing, although Nvidia is still ahead on the hardware ray tracing side of things. From a programming perspective, looking at some of the nuts and bolts under the hood with the programming API and so what some of the Dirt 5 team has been doing uh, from like a binary analysis standpoint, it does seem like the ray tracing components of the 6700 XT have some room for improvement. There's some, there's some performance uh, headroom there, I think, let's say. But, you know, I'm not on the driver team. I don't have any special inside knowledge or, or anything like that. And my look at that is admittedly probably pretty naive. That said, Dirt 5, they've promised by the end of the month-ish, uh, somewhere, you know, beginning of April, somewhere through there, that there's gonna be an update and they're gonna release the ray tracing support publicly for the 6700 XT. All things being equal, could not test that with this card for this launch. So, you know, your mileage may vary. Don't buy a card for features that aren't here right now would be my best advice, but AMD's giving it a pretty good go. In terms of pricing, well, Everything is completely on fire and the world is burning down. Uh, availability, everything is completely on fire and the world is burning down. Micro Center has promised that these GPUs are gonna be uh, generally available in, in significant quantities. And I can kind of confirm that, but significant quantities may still not be enough because the whole market has been starved for GPUs for quite some time. And it's really a giant mess and I have no idea. At MSRP of 479, it's a little bit cheaper than the MSRP of the competing card at the similar price point. But this card is, I think, a little above that card in terms of overall performance, you know, except unless DLSS enters the equation. So I think the question is, if you had the opportunity to buy this card, would you be happy with this card? And I think the answer probably is yes. If you're gaming a 3440 by 1440 widescreen, which we haven't really talked about, uh, it's a really good performer because a lot of games, again, it's that nonlinear scaling. The performance of 3440 widescreen is often closer to 4K gaming, you know, the 3840 by 2160 resolution than it is by 2560 by 1440. Ironically, in terms of number of pixels, 3440 by 1440 is closer to 2560 by 1440 in terms of the number of pixels, but the performance is in reality is often closer to 4k it varies a little bit with game resolution and some other parameters you know you got to do a deep dive on that to kind of figure that out but generally that's that's true fortunately you can use fidelity fx and play with the numbers a little bit you can play with the visual fidelity a little bit but you know again 12 gigs of vram pretty nice setup let's talk about day one linux support now day one linux support on this card like the 6800 the 6800 xt is pretty darn good i think it's about as good as amd can do given the current climate with distros and all that other stuff. There's a little bit of an asterisk there. If you are uh, uninitiated in Linux, it's not quite plug and play. You've got to jump through some hoops. Fortunately, when the 6800 and the 6800 XT launched, I wrote a guide on the level one forum. That guide is still there. It still applies for the 6700 XT. But the trickiest thing that you got to do that I recommend is that you download the latest firmware or the, the latest binary blob for this card that goes with the open source driver on Linux um, from the Linux firmware Git repository. It, it takes a little bit for distro maintainers to update the package that that you know is maintained by like Ubuntu, Fedora, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just follow my guide. And you'll basically be okay. We got to color outside the lines a little bit with the way stuff works on Linux in terms of the package maintainer, uh, but it's really not bad. Um, 
you run into this kind of thing with Linux with, with newer hardware. I've had an incredibly positive experience with the 6800 XT on Linux that I've been running continuously since launch day on Linux. It has been very, very good from kernel 5.8 to I'm running the 5.12 version of the kernel that doesn't have the swap file bug. Whoops. Uh, it's been very, very good to track progress in the Linux kernel and all the support that goes with that. I've only had a few hours of testing uh, with this on the Linux kernel, but it, it works well enough for Steam and the Proton games that I've tested. So again, I think AMD deserves a little bit of credit there for the open source driver, the contributions to the community. They're really, oh, they're doing their best. Yeah, it's not perfect, but it's pretty darn good. I don't think we could really expect better given the ecosystem and framework that they have to work within. So overall, that's been a quick look at the 6700 XT. Again, I'm very impressed. Look for another video on the Linux channel probably in two or three days. I'm, I've got some feelers out to some distro folks and there's some stuff we're gonna talk about. Maybe doing a live stream with uh, some insiders there. I don't know. Look for that on the Linux channel. I'm Wendell, this is level one. The 6700 XT gets a big thumbs up from me. And uh, look for me in the forum. If you pick one up or you decide to do a build with one of these and you wanna show it off, come to the level one forums and let's see it. All right, I'm signing out and I'll see you there.